Well, good morning to one and all. It's great to see you. It's a wonderful blessing to be able to come together in an assembly like this and to visit and slap each other on the shoulder and shake hands and, and everything. It's uh, one of the blessings we've kind of been missing a little bit, but it is certainly appreciated that we're, we're being able to experience again more and more of our freedoms and our blessings that we have. Uh, it's great to have everyone here. We are especially appreciative of having our visitors here. We hope that you go away um, feeling like uh, you've been made to feel welcome because indeed we, we do want you to be welcomed here and, and uh, know that we appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, we appreciate everyone uh, making it here this morning and uh, we'll be um, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> if you would, bow with me and we'll have prayer to get going. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this beautiful day. And we thank you for all the beautiful people who are here today and, and for this opportunity and this blessing and freedom to assemble like this so that we can in in unison, lift up our voices of praise and thanksgiving to you. You are an awesome God, and we do appreciate and love you so. Father, as we go into this period of worship, we do pray that you will help us to lay aside all of the burdens and cares of the world and and be able to fully focus and concentrate upon your majesty and your greatness. And may we be encouraged and learn, uh, learn more as, as we speak to one another in the psalms and hymns and the spiritual songs that we'll be engaged in as we spend a few minutes in study of your word <clears throat> uh, in the sermon later. We pray that you will receive our worship, and it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning and a warm welcome to you all, and also to those of you who will be seeing this on YouTube, welcome. Let's sing three verses of praise the Lord.
How firm a foundation. And isn't it? We'll sing three verses. How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who unto Jesus for refuge have fled? Father, Father, we thank you for this day, for Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for his church, that we might be able to assemble together and offer worship unto you through his name. Father, for the many opportunities that we have to serve in his church. And we pray that we may be diligent in service, that we might be mindful of the talents and abilities that you have given each of us. And Father, we would ask your blessings upon our mission efforts. The Navajo Nation, those who strive to spread the gospel in that area, Father, we offer a very special prayer on behalf of Philip James that it may be your will that he will receive the treatment that will cure his eyesight problems. We pray for Sekhemi and Mojima and Emike as they labor in your kingdom in, in Nigeria, often under very difficult and, and, and dangerous conditions, Father. We pray for their safety, that they may be able to continue the good work that they're doing. And Father, we are thankful for the Manuelito and Children's States Children's Homes. We ask that you would be with those who have dedicated their lives to the care and the well-being of, of those children. And especially, Father, for the spiritual guidance that these children receive. We pray that they'll take the knowledge of your word with them as they become adults, when they leave the, the uh, homes. We pray that they might be strong and faithful children of yours. Father, we are mindful of those of our number who are sick. We ask your blessings upon them. We pray for our nation during this time of unrest. We pray that there may be peace and understanding with all. Father, we ask that you continue to bless and keep us. 
These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Before we have the scripture and the lesson, we'll sing Higher Ground, three verses of that song. If you're able, let's stand for the song and for the scripture. I'm pressing, pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward round, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on reading is coming from Luke chapter 6 verse 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was led a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked, and licked his soul. The time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now his comfort her and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chance has been set in place, so, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, 
If they do not listen to Moses and the prophet, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Joseph, for that good Bible reading. Jesus was indeed the master storyteller, wasn't he? Now that I know, and you know, he was so much more than that. There's lots of people that have been able to tell a good story, sing a pretty song, write a good novel. Jesus was more than just someone who went around telling good stories. In John chapter 6, you'll remember that Jesus told some things that the people didn't think were so good. And in fact, they began to leave. And Jesus asked his disciples, will you too go away? And Peter replied, well, where else would we go? To whom else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So you and I, we listen to Jesus, not just because he says good things, but he says good things that make a difference in this world and in the world to come. But the world has recognized Jesus as the master storyteller. And so many artists, have seized upon his words and in his teachings. And this morning, if we had time, instead of just one slide on the monitor with two pictures, I suppose I could put up a hundred or more and not take too long in looking for them. The story about a rich man, haughty, arrogant, satisfied, and a poor beggar that lay outside his doorway, so full of misery, the only relief he could find was when the dogs would come and lick his running sores. And how that both of them died, and both of them were called into judgment. Now then, we preach that here at Pikes Peak just about every Sunday morning, don't we? But we don't say it the way that Jesus said it. We don't tell it the way that Jesus told it. And this morning we want to take a few minutes in thinking about this narrative we find in Luke chapter 16. And you know it's not just the artist with his paintbrush, his easel, his oils, his watercolors, that draws such a compelling picture of this story that Jesus told. But it's also the story that translates well when we see it on film or in video. You know, the word videography, cinematography, those words weren't around until a little bit more than a hundred years ago. Cinema from the French theater, and graphe from the Greek to write. You know, some people that couldn't hardly draw a straight line couldn't produce an oil painting. If their life depended on it, they may be able to take a camera and some actors and portray a story. And you know, we're living in the day and age where people increasingly so. They learn not by what they read, but what they see. And one reason why, oh my goodness, 15 years or so ago, here at Pikes Peak, Kevin and I began the PowerPoint every Sunday morning. And every Bible class that we could, because that visual reinforcement helps most of us. And so this morning I have a short video clip. It's taken from the Lumo Project. And I referred to these people before and no doubt I will again. It's an ambitious project to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just read the text while the story plays out. And I think it's real well done. But if you're looking at this, you may begin to notice there's something of a little difference 
between what the words actually say and the way that these artists interpret the story. So there's the beggar, and he's pitiful. The video doesn't include the dogs that came along to lick his souls. But here's where a little bit of artistic license comes in. Here was a beggar that Jesus saw, that Jesus knew perhaps, that Jesus in his passing by witnessed. And here was a beggar that died in Jesus' arms. Well, if you're looking at Luke 16, you may be thinking, I don't read that. But it does illustrate one of the factors and the matters that people sometimes raise when we talk about this story. Was it the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Or was it an actual historical event? Something that really happened. Something that was true. Well, to my way of thinking, that wording is that wording is wrong. All the parables that Jesus taught were true. True to life. Jesus didn't talk about animals talking, about bushes and trees singing a song. Jesus didn't have people flying when he told the story. Everything Jesus said in his parables reflected real everyday life. But some suggest that, you know, I'm not so sure this was a made up story by the master teacher. But instead, Jesus is talking about something that he saw happen with his own eyes. You know, if you're looking at Luke, Twelve times in the Gospel of Luke, Luke has this wording or something similar to it, and he spoke a parable unto them. So twelve times Luke goes out of his way, and he has Jesus speaking a parable. Well, in this context, Luke doesn't use that phrase. So why not this morning, Check your own Bible. Here's a picture from a page that I use in one of my computer Bibles, and you'll notice it's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Not every Bible has that subheading. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, it really doesn't make that much difference. Maybe this was a beggar that Jesus needed. Maybe Jesus knew his backstory. Maybe Jesus knew the rich man. Maybe Jesus knew him personally. And Jesus knew about the circumstances of his day. Well, maybe so. After all, when we look at the verses on the screen this morning, they are different from other parables that Jesus taught. For one thing, Jesus names people in this story. Lazarus has a name. Abraham has a name. For another thing, the other stories or parables that Jesus told, they were earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. You can pick up something and throw at me if you haven't heard that definition of a parable. That's the one that we all know. Well, this story is earthly, yes, but it's the only time that Jesus in such color, such detail, parted the curtain and allows us to see into the next world. So this story is indeed different. And this morning I want to highlight or emphasize just four points from the story. To reinforce what an amazing teacher our Lord was. You'll remember at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, all the people were amazed or astonished by the way Jesus spoke. 
That word amazed found 12 times in the New Testament. And one time it describes in Luke chapter 9 the people's reaction to a miracle. Jesus casting out an unclean spirit. And there is something that by definition a miracle is eye-popping, surprising, astounding, astonishing. Well, so too the way that Jesus taught. Matthew 13, he's in Nazareth, his boyhood told time. And after he finished speaking in the synagogue, the people turn and ask one another, who is this? I thought we knew. Isn't his mother Mary? Aren't his brothers? And they could name his name. We saw him every day, year after year after year. But now, where did he get this wisdom? And where did he get this power? John chapter 7, the soldiers sent to arrest Jesus coming back empty-handed. And when it was demanded of them, why? What happened? All they could say was never a man spoke like this man spoke. Here's the story that Jesus told and here's the four points that you and I want to glean from it this morning. And the first few verses, there's a certain bad living in misery, poverty, want, hunger, and despair. And then just behind the door, there's the rich man who fared sumptuously every day. Not only had what he needed, he had more than what he needed. And I suggest to you this morning in this room, there's not a beating heart, there's not a feeling heart among us that has not been moved by the disparity, the great divide between the haves and the have-nots that you and I See, every single day, we need not go to the third world to witness that. It's more disturbing there, I grant you, but we see that even here in Colorado Springs. And the observation could be made, that's just not fair. It's not fair. And here I'll date myself a little bit. I read once that if you had the original VHS tape and the packaging of those old Disney classics, you're sitting on a fortune. Have you heard that? Well, we wore our tapes out. And so there's no fortune left there. But you remember that opening scene from the Lion King and there was the lion and the mouse that he caught. And as the lion holds up the mouse, he contemplates in a philosophical vein, life's not fair. I was made to be the hunter and you were made to be the hunted. Life's not fair. You know, we live again in a day and age where people are trying hard to reimagine Jesus, revision Jesus, reinterpret Jesus. And there are people, and I have no doubt they're sincere and well meaning, but this is the question that percolates in their mind and heart and soul more than any other. How come? Why didn't Jesus fix the world that we live in? There's hungry. There are the poor. There are the oppressed. There are the downtrodden. There are the enslaved. And you know, that's the way the world was when Jesus was born. And that's the world he left behind when he ascended back to the Father. And why wasn't Jesus more of a warrior on 
some of these social matters, does it mean that he didn't see, that he didn't care? And I dare say at some point you either have or you will work your way through that conversation. But it is true that there's a great disparity in this world and the observation is truly noted. No, life is not fair. Solomon, back almost a thousand years before Jesus was born, pondered this at length. And if you read Proverbs and especially Ecclesiastes, you'll find that he comes up on this thought just every now and then. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11, it's not the fastest that wins every race. You would think that's the way that it would work out. It's not the strongest that always prevails in battle. It's not the smartest that makes the most money. Can I hear an amen for that? It's not the one he would think that would have every advantage that comes out on top. But notice what his conclusion is. Time and chance happens to every one. Now then, Solomon's talking about a grand principle. And we don't want to stretch his words beyond the meaning that he puts in. My kids, your kids, we encourage to go to school, stay in school, learn all you can. Because we know that helps prepare someone down the road in life. And there's no substitute for that. And yet we also realize that there are folks like, I think Bill Gates is the classic example. Quit college, founded a little startup named Microsoft, and the rest is history. Life doesn't always turn out the way that you think it ought to. Solomon saw that and he wondered about it. And in Ecclesiastes he says, you know I set my hand to do everything I could. I gathered wealth. I built buildings. I conquered territories. I did everything according to the blessings and the opportunities that God gave me. And you know, when I die, my inheritance will go to folks and maybe they don't try nearly so hard. And in fact, in the blunt language of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says the day will come that the fool will inherit it all. Life just doesn't seem fair. And when we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, there is suffering. There's hunger, there's want, there's need. And even though this was told nearly 2,000 years ago, we can read it fresh this morning, and the middle picture of that door being closed and the servants trying to hustle the beggar. Go find another spot where you're out of sight, out of mind. That's the world that Jesus lived in and that's the world that you and I live in. Now then that can make us bitter. That can fill us with resentment. Or it may cause us to react in the opposite way. That's the way life is. It is what it is. Always has been, always will be in a sense of resignation. Or it might fill us with the resolve to do what we can to relieve the afflicted, to care for the orphan, to care for the widows in their distress and all those who have need. And you know, if my arms aren't long enough to fix the whole wide world, 
I can start right here where I can reach the people that I meet and the people that I know. But here's the first observation from Jesus' story. The second, we read how that in the passing of time, the beggar died. And the rich man died too. The only difference noted, the beggar died and nothing was said about his burial so much. There was a potter's field, a beggar's field in Jerusalem, just on the other side of the Valley of Hinnom. It's still there today. It's being excavated. The rich man died. And there we read that he was buried. But more important than the burial was their remaining destiny. But death comes to all. Again in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 14, Solomon says, I have seen a vanity under the sun. And you'll recall that that word vanity means emptiness, worthlessness, futility. Solomon says, you know, the righteous sometimes have the fate of the wicked. The wicked sometimes have the fate of the righteous. But in this world, one thing happens. They all die. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. The Hebrew writer there in Hebrews chapter 2 has this arresting phrase. He talks about all those who were throughout their lives subject to the fear of death, the tyranny of death, the bondage of death. It's not something that we delight in dwelling on. But we know. We all know. That it's appointed for us to be born. And here we are for a while. And then just as James asked. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little while. And then passes away. Job says it's like the postman or the message. And he comes up your front sidewalk and it's the Amazon fella. He's got a delivery. And you can be outside and ask him how he's doing. Busy day. Cold enough for you. Whatever. He's no time to talk. He's got to get to the next stop. And Job says it's like someone that gallops up and gives you a message and then gallops away. That's how life is. It's like an eagle that flies along. You see him and then he's gone. That's all of us. And it's true in the story that Jesus told. It happened to the poor man and it happened to the rich man. And I suppose you've heard the story, the same, the observation. Rich and the poor, the hole is six feet deep for both of them. Death is that great equalizer. But then Jesus said something else. Not only did the rich man die, and not only did the poor man die, but then there was the separation. A judgment and a parting of the ways. Now, then I'll grant you that in this parable or story that Jesus told, he doesn't tell us everything. It's a short story. If Jesus had told us every detail, it would have been as long as a Grady Miller sermon. And so, not everything is told in it. The poor man wasn't blessed just because he didn't have any money. And the rich man wasn't condemned just because he was wealthy. That's not the lesson here. And no one would read this and misunderstand, I don't think. But there's cause and effect. The way they lived here Determine their where. And the there. And that's 
maybe the number one lesson we would take from a reading and study of God's Word. This world is a proving ground. This world is a time of test and trial. This time world is a world, a time in which we demonstrate and exercise our faith. Because what we do in this body will determine where and what we will do when we're without this body in an eternity to come. Galatians chapter 6, there the apostle wrote in verse 7, don't be fooled. Don't forget about this. It may be so far off in the distance, out of sight, out of mind. Don't be that way. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever you sow, that too you will reap. I think an interesting verse is found in Romans chapter 2 and verse 6. And again, you might check your own Bible this morning. If you'll notice on the monitor, part of chapter 2 and verse 6 is in quotation marks. In your Bible, it may be in italics. It may be indented. Some other way to show you that Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. That whatever a man sows, he will reap. God will reward according to our deeds. Paul's quoting from what you and I call the Old Testament. What verse is he quoting from? Well, you know, some Bibles just have the text, and that's okay. Some Bibles have charts and maps and notes, and that's okay. Some Bibles are reference Bibles, and they're either in the center column or at the bottom of the page, somewhere on the page, it will have all the different quotations, allusions, references to another passage in the Bible. The one that I use most often, it has Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, and then it has four Old Testament passages. One in Job, one in Psalm, one in Proverbs, one in Jeremiah. And if you do a little digging in a word search, you'll find that others could be cited. In other words, Paul grabbed a quotation from the Old Testament and he could have gone to all these different places to get it. You know, when God says something one time, it's important. When he says it twice, when he says it three times, when he says it four times, when he says it over and over and over, We'd better get it. And that's the lesson here from Romans 2 and verse 6. God's going to judge everyone according to their deeds. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there we will be judged according to the deeds done in our body or in our flesh or in this lifetime. Revelation. John says, I saw the books were open and the dead and great were gathered. And they were judged, every one, according to their works. That's a lesson that we learn from this great story that our Lord told. And then the last lesson that we'll look at this morning. It's pitiful how the rich man said, I've got brothers. And they're living just like I lived my life. And they're not mindful of the responsibility their wealth has brought. They've passed over countless opportunities to do good for others. They live in their own isolated little cocoon, unmindful of the misery of the rest of the world. They're just like me, and now I'm lost and in misery and torment. Send Lazarus back and have him deliver a message. And when they see that ghost materialize, 
They'll believe then. And then in words kind of hard for us to imagine. Abraham says, Jesus says, no, they wouldn't be changed, not even if one rose up and spoke to them from the dead. And you and I, we kind of rebel against that thought, don't we? Someone that you love, someone that you lost, mom, dad, brother, sister, husband, wife, if you were to see a vision so real that you knew it was true, telling you when you leave the church building today, don't drive that way, go the other route. I believe I'd go the other route. I believe I'd put stock in what I thought was someone coming back from the dead, but Jesus, knowing human nature, said, no, not so. They may be scared. They may change for a while. But they'll think through it and not even a vision of one coming back from the dead. They have God's Word. And that's enough. This morning, the fourth, the last, and maybe the greatest point is simply this. We need to listen and work while we can. We need to hasten and do while we yet have time to come to the Lord and find the forgiveness and the salvation that He affords to be washed in the blood that He shed because there's a great day coming and when that day comes the book of our life will be closed and the book of God's judgment will be open and how will we stand then this morning if you're not a child of God we wouldn't scare you and terrify you so much that's not our aim but we would plead and beg with you. Instead of me looking at your life or the church looking at your life, you look at your life. You look at your own life. And is the Lord God first and foremost? Are you wearing the name of Jesus? Have you put him on in baptism? If not, there's time yet. Why not for you this morning while we stand and as we sing this song together? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all
Well, good morning to everyone. At the beginning of services, or just prior to services, Mike Nelson was here, and uh, he looked out and he said, you know, I lost my train of thought. I nearly yelled out amen. Uh, because I, I know the feeling, Mike, I do. Um, I hope I won't lose my train of thought as I uh, discuss a couple of special prayer requests we've received this week. I was thinking that in life there are certain words or events that change your life forever. Uh, perhaps if you've been a mom or a dad, you, the doctor looks across the desk and says, you're going to have a baby, all right? Life changes forever at that point. Or maybe uh, a, a potential employer says, we'd like to bring you on board. Here, here will be, is your pay. Here are the benefits. Your life will never be the same again because now you're going to go pursue a certain career or with a certain job. Maybe the words, I do, or I now pronounce you man and wife are that way, too. There's another word, though, that comes up and in life, usually a little later on, and that word is cancer. And when we hear that word, it doesn't matter whether it's your diagnosis or someone else's, we catch our breath, don't we? We, we, we pull in a bit of breath and say, I don't want to hear that word. And this week, we had three prayer requests specifically related to cancer. You heard one uh, this morning if you were in class. Uh, Kevin mentioned that Mona Bowers has been diagnosed this week with, uh, with uh, breast cancer. She's going back to the doctor, obviously, for more tests. I uh, talked with her yesterday, and she asked for a, a prayer request. Also, John Ryan heard from Pam yesterday. John uh, goes back into chemotherapy on Tuesday. He typically spends three to five days there, so please pray for John. That new form of chemotherapy seems to be just attacking that brain uh, tumor, that brain cancer, and so there is some hope that he can get up to Denver for that bone marrow transplant. The third is a phone call Chuni and I received yesterday from my sister, my kid's sister. She's 10 years younger than I am. Her husband has a very serious case of brain cancer, so much so that he's really lost his ability to walk effectively. It's uh, impacting his motor skills more than his thinking, and she also asked for a prayer. And with that, would you all bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we, uh, as Grady explained so well in his sermon, Father, uh, live this life as best we can, and it's not necessarily fair. Why does a young person get cancer or have, suffer an accident? Why do some things not really have a cause and effect relationship? We live a righteous life, a good life, and yet things happen to us which are not fair. We might think of that in terms of these three people that we'll pray for, uh, all of them in younger age, at least not yet at 70 years of age. And we think of John Ryan, his um, months and months now of battling this cancer, back uh, Tuesday for another round of chemotherapy. And we pray, Father, that those two small tumors will uh, be reduced such that he could get that follow-on operation and perhaps one day, Father, be declared clear of his cancer. Father, we pray for our sister Mona Bowers, who found out this week that she has uh, breast cancer. We pray for her, the doctors that will attend to her, and all her friends and the members of this congregation that will now surround her with love and support as they get her through this. For my brother-in-law, Eddie Atchison, Eddie is, uh, again, a younger man and uh, has contracted a very a serious form of cancer. And Father, we pray for the doctors that will be treating him this coming week. Lord, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now be led in our song before the communion. We'll sing all three verses of the Lord's Supper.
a touching song, isn't it? As we celebrate this morning the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'd like for us to think on this few scriptures in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. It says, This is good and please God, pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in his proper time. You know, as this scripture says, there's only one avenue to eternal life, and this is to our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, as we prepare our minds uh, to partake of this emblems that represent Number one, the body of Christ, as he was nailed on that cross, as he suffered on that cross, physically and mentally. And also, as we take of the cup, that uh, it's an emblem of his blood that was shed for our sins, for you and I and all mankind. And as we do so, let's be mindful of that. Let's pray. Father, we again... Uh, we look to you for comfort, for peace in our lives. As our lesson said this morning, life isn't fair sometimes. And as we've heard the uh, three prayer requests, it indicate the same. But you know, Father, we know that uh, you love us so much that we can always depend on you for comfort and peace and healing. And Father, you gave your son because you loved us. He gave his life because he loved us. And help us, Father, to always be mindful of that. As we take uh, this emblem of the bread, we are mindful that uh, Jesus was nailed to that cross. He was hurt. He suffered. And all because of us. All because of my sins. That's why he did that. And Father, as we take this, we always want to keep in mind that you and your son Jesus have your arms around us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. prepare for the cup. Let's pray once again. Father, once again, we're, because of your love from you and your son Jesus, we're humbled. And we're grateful for that. As Jesus shed his blood for us and be able to give us hope of eternal life. We're grateful for that. Thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we concluded the Lord's Supper, as we've been commanded, for opportunity and also for convenience, this is the time we can give back of our blessings. And uh, as our lesson this morning from Brother Grady so appropriately in Luke chapter 16, I'm sure that some of you do the same as I do when I'm listening to a lesson, when I'm preparing for a lesson, I write all over my Bible. I hear a note, I write notes, what somebody said or what I'm thinking. So my Bible is full of notes, you can see right here. And in Luke chapter 16, sometime I must have been listening to a lesson, and I titled that chapter, Attitude on Money. I know that this lesson was not all about money, but it was riches, 
and those that don't have and those that have and those that don't have. So as we are blessed daily, uh, both spiritually and physically and fiscally, we have an opportunity to give back and uh, be grateful for those things that we do have and sometimes we take for granted. And there's some out there that don't have that luxury. And we always be, should be mindful of that. And the Lord Kingdom, Lord's Kingdom needs our support and our help here and elsewhere. So let's pray. Father, again, we are so grateful for all you do for us. We're grateful for the blessings you give us spiritually, physically, and also in a physical sense. And Father, we ask that you help us to always be mindful of that. And Father, to always give back with giving and loving hearts and that uh, your kingdom can always grow, not only here, but elsewhere. Father, we ask that you continue to be with us and be with those that are in need at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your voices this morning. Sounds good. We'll sing three verses of this song and then we'll have a prayer and some announcements. announcements and then there will be some more announcements. Let us pray. Holy Father in heaven, thank you for your blessings, Father. And Father, we do ask for your additional blessings on this nation, Father, the, the great experiment, if you will, the refuge and hope for some and other nations. And Father, we ask that as we go through our lives, Father, may we be counted among the righteous. May we not lose sight of that, Father. And Father, we do ask for your mercy. 
but we also stand, understand that you are a just and righteous God. And Father, we ask for your blessings also on ours that may be shut in. <clears throat> Father, let us be an encouragement to them. And Father, those that are suffering infirmities, Father, bless them that they may be returned to good health, but also bless their medical staffs that they'll prescribe good and correct treatments, Lord. And Father, as we go throughout this week, Father, we look for opportunities where we may be able to do those things that are right in your sight and speak up or remain silent as you require us. But Father, also that you would bless us to use some of the most powerful tools that you have given us, Father, and that is to vote with our feet, to vote with our ballots, Father, and to vote with our dollars. And guide us to do these things wisely, Father, and bless our representatives that they may be the kind of people that you would have them to be, Father, but, but also bless us that we may recognize the evil done in the dark. And Father, may that evil be exposed to the light for all to see. And Father, we praise your holy name. Name your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, and we've got several announcements that we want to share with you. First of all, we regret so very much, and we extend our deepest sympathy to the family of Ion Llewellyn. For many years, of course, you know that Don and Ion sat right up front in the middle of the auditorium on Sunday mornings. We said goodbye to Don a few years ago, and our own has carried on this last year with the pandemic, has robbed us of precious time being with her in this life, but we so look forward to our reunion one of these days. We don't know when, but we know where, and God grant us that precious gift. There will be a memorial service for our own. Right now, it's tentatively scheduled for our building, May the 13th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Details are still being worked out by the family. If there's a change, we'll certainly let you know. But that will give us an appropriate time and setting to say our last farewell to our sister Ion. We also want to remember that tomorrow, big day, Brother Tony Harrison will have his surgery. It's finally been scheduled and everything is ready. And our prayers are with Tony and Peggy as he undergoes this cardiac surgery. And my understanding is that it's involved and it will take some time for the surgeons to complete that task. And we'll pass along an update just as soon as we're able to. But, Tony, we are thinking about you. And you and Peggy are certainly in our prayers. And that will be tomorrow. And we also want to remember Mona Bowers, her recent diagnosis. And we're keeping her in our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, and indeed in our prayers. Brother John Ryan, John had a series of chemo treatments this past week, and that takes such a toll on him. There's some evidence that they're doing some good, and John being the strong fighter that he is, he's maintaining that course. And for John and for Pam, they are always in our prayers. Barbara Bagwell's recent surgery to remove the hardware from her foot and ankle went very well. And we're so glad to pass along that good report. Not too many days from now, May the 1st, Les Jones has a men's breakfast schedule. And you can call. Contact us, and we'll be happy to share all the information about that. May the 2nd, there's a shower, a baby shower, 
at our building for Jessica and Spencer Van Camp. Jessica is registered on Amazon. That's a quick and convenient way to do it. But if you're looking up her information, she's still listed as Jessica Marshall. Haven't had the opportunity to switch that over yet. And so if you'll look up Jessica Marshall, you'll find the information and we can celebrate with them and the birth of this little baby boy that's due to make his arrival soon. And then we also want to emphasize that we've got some big changes coming. Our Sunday schedule in the building here at the Pikes Peak Church. Now then our online, we're still having our one o'clock worship stream. Kevin's Bible class at five o'clock, that won't change, but what will change? At the building, every Lord's Day morning for four Sundays, the second, third, fourth, and fifth Sundays in June. So that's two weeks from today. We're trying, I guess you could call it a bit of an experiment to see how it goes. You know, when we would start back up on Sunday evenings and Wednesday night, midweek, Bible study, prayer meeting, you know, we've been feeling our way to see just what the best arrangement might be for that. So here's what we're going to try. On Sundays, we're going to come together, Bible classes for all ages at 9 o'clock, and then worship in the auditorium at 10 o'clock. That hasn't changed, but here's what's new and different. At 11 or so, when we dismiss, we will have a half hour of fellowshipping, of visiting, of being with one another, uh, downstairs, there will be some drinks and some snacks provided for those that want to make their way down the stairs or ride the lift down the stairs. And a half hour or so of relaxing. And then at 1130 or so, we're going to assemble again in the auditorium. This is not worship service number two. This is something else, something different, something extra, we might say. Now then the kids are going to stay downstairs. Kevin and Kelly Ballard and Carissa Ballard and maybe some others are going to be involved with a program for our youth. And they will be doing some things downstairs, and the adults will be in the auditorium. And for another half hour or so, you'll have to put up with me again. It won't be another sermon. Uh, my goodness, we know better than that. It'll be in the format of a Bible class, open discussion, participation, question and answers, and I'm not just real sure exactly what we're going to be doing. I think for these four weeks, we're going to vary it. We're going to do something a little different every Sunday there at the 1130 hour and see which one suits us best and figure it out kind of as we go along. But then after a half hour or so, the two groups will come back together and we'll have a short time for singing and praying and a short devotional talk. And the Lord's Supper will be offered for those that perhaps were not able to assemble with us on Sunday morning. And then we will break for the day at about 1230. So it's a bit longer in our time commitment. Come for, Bob, for Kevin's Bible class at nine o'clock in the morning. Stay for the 10 o'clock worship service. Enjoy a short break. Come back together for another little while. And then 
that will be our Sunday schedule for four Sundays, the second, third, fourth, and fifth Sundays in the month of May, and that's what we're going to be trying. Is that what we will do from here on out until the Lord comes? I, I don't know. Will we go back to our typical five o'clock Sunday evening worship service at some point in time? I don't know. But what I do know is that we want to give this a good, fair try. See how our members respond to it, especially those who live some distance away from the church building. We think this might be a great help for them. But as always, We'll want to know what you think, what you have to say, and I'm sure that you'll be happy to share your input with us. We're asking for it, and in fact, we're counting on it, so let us know. That's it for today. Until the next time that we're able to come together, may the Lord bless and keep us all.